Okay, so now we're ready to start with module two on clinical research considerations and definitions. So here's an initial case study for you to consider. A new drug compound, bruinite sulfate, this is our investigational agent, is identified as a potential therapeutic for DMD. How long would it take before it reaches the shelves of the local pharmacy? And who should be included in the target subject population in our clinical trial? We'll take the answer to that case up a little bit later in the talk, but let's give you the foundation for being able to answer the research question or the a case question um, by providing you with some data about drug development. So as you can see, this is the current state of clinical trials. And this is the registration of clinical trials in clinicaltrials.gov, which was mentioned in module one. As you can see, in the year 2000, there were a number of studies that were registered in the low uh, 3000s, 4000s. And all of a sudden, there was this steep escalation in the number of clinical trials that were registered over time with two key activities that promulgated this rise exponentially in the number of registered clinical trials. The first one was the International Council of Medical Journal Editors that made the decision that clinical trials, which were to be published in this international group of journals, would be required to have been registered prior to them being um, taking on their first patients and um, implementing the interventions that were associated with those studies. So clinical trials needed to be registered in order to be able to be published in these international journals. And that was an important requirement and has since now been a requirement of most scientific and medical journals that publish clinical trials and clinical research. The first question that these journals will ask is who conducted the IRB approval and was this clinical trial registered in clinicaltrials.gov or a similar registry. In addition, the FDA Amendments Act was in the year 2008, I believe, and that required that all clinical trials results also be reported in that clinicaltrials.gov registry. So now we have the clinical trial being registered with all its important components, such as its purpose, the inclusion exclusion criteria, the procedures that are going to be required as part of the study. But now this FDA requirement requires that the study also publish the results in that online clinicaltrials.gov registry. So over time, we've had thousands and thousands of clinical trials being re registered, and this provides transparency about the clinical research process so that negative trials are not squelched by pharmaceutical companies and that all results become part of the scientific um, publication process and are known to all scientists so there aren't repetitions of research that might have been ineffective in the past. So with regard to this registration, we can see what worked in the past, what didn't work, and not have to duplicate efforts. You can see the numbers along here as well um, as they increase over time. So let's talk about the cost of drug development. We keep mentioning it, but let's really hone in on it. The average cost of drug development based upon the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association estimates is that it's about $800 million to $1 billion. That's a significant amount of money, and many of the pharmaceutical companies want to recoup that drug and development cost when they start to figure out what to charge patients for their prescriptions later on. Much of this depends upon the drug type and the target population being studied. You may have heard in the news about the new hepatitis C drug. It is meant to treat hepatitis C, and most patients are cured of the disease, but it's at an $80,000 price tag, which is a significant amount of money and is probably the highest, um, most expensive drug on the market 
um, especially to treat hepatitis C. But if it significantly reduces healthcare expenditures because these patients are being treated with the drug, then the 80,000 is a worthwhile investment. Some of the contributing expenses to clinical research are the preclinical testing cost. Those are the animal and uh, laboratory testing that is conducted before the, a drug or a device is being tested in humans. The clinical testing cost, those clinical trials we've been speaking about, where subjects are seen at a clinical research site and go through a number of procedures and interventions where data is collected, such as health data, um, medical data, laboratory data, and um, the, uh, the products of research are the data and those laboratory specimens and the analysis of those lab specimens. So those are so important um, in terms of making sure that we obtain those during the course of the trial and that they are analyzed um, accurately. Regulatory costs can place a burden on trials because of all the federal, state, and institutional requirements that are part of a clinical research trial. And following those guidelines requires a number of people as regulatory coordinators to make sure that everything is following the standards and good clinical practices. Manufacturing costs of a drug are very important. Sometimes drugs are made in the United States and sometimes they are made abroad. And the cost for producing and manufacturing drugs is significant because we've got to make sure that their good manufacturing practices are followed, that the facilities are clean and up to the FDA standards. And when they're not, the FDA can shut down a number of manufacturing plants that have problems, and we've seen this in the past. Failure rates, failure rates of drugs are significant, and we'll see that in our next slide when we talk about the drug development process. And we have expensive supplies and equipment that are required as part of clinical trials. One of the lowest published costs for um, developing a drug was $175 million for a particular antibiotic that was used to treat a bacteria. But let's go into the drug development process and see what's really involved. Okay, so let's go over the phases of drug development. This is a schematic of the phases, and it's produced by the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, where we see we have basic research that occurs first, drug discovery, preclinical, and clinical trial phases in the drug development process. And we'll speak about these in just one moment. But basic research is in the laboratory trying to find agents or new modalities or antibodies or stem cells that may prove to prevent or treat disease. And we have a number of medicines that are usually tested in these areas. And this is approximately 5,000 compounds that may be tested in order to eventually approve one FDA um, medicine that's going to eventually be on the pharmaceutical cell. So you can see how the failure rate previously mentioned on the other slide uh, can be significant for the pharmaceutical companies and sometimes they try and recoup their cost on one blockbuster drug, the one blockbuster that makes it to market. So preclinical is laboratory and animal studies. Oftentimes the animal studies are conducted in two species, although that may not be required, but the FDA is responsible for making sure that all the preclinical information that occurs before we test in humans is adequate and provides all the safety information that we need before we attempt to even test the new agent in a single human being. So there may be multiple species that the FDA requires, or it may be a single species that may be sufficient for the FDA to move forward with human trials. In phase one trials, we usually have tens, dozens of patients they, that may participate in a clinical trial. And as you can see, it'll increase the number of volunteers in a clinical trial as we go through the phases. Phase one, what we're interested in is safety. If this is our first time in human beings, we wanna make sure this particular agent is safe. And we may start to look at the appropriate dose. This is where 
we try different doses and see what might work and what is safe. And sometimes we do something called a dose escalation study, where we start with a small dose just to test for safety and move incrementally up to see what might be the most appropriate dose to move on into phase two studies. Phase two study are usually done in hundreds of volunteers. And in phase two studies, we'll continue to look at safety, but now we're gonna look more closely at dosing, and we will also start to look at efficacy of the new agent and see whether or not it's going to work. Phase two studies can be sometimes split into phase 2A and phase 2B studies with the safety and dosing being done in phase 2A and the dosing and efficacy being done in phase 2B. Thereafter, we start into phase 3 studies, and phase 3 studies were most interested in continuing on with looking at safety, but efficacy becomes important because we would have made a decision about the particular dose that's most important in this particular population that we're studying. Here we're looking at thousands of individuals and collecting data on thousands of individuals because they'll be on different medicines, so that's called concomitant medications, or they might have other disease conditions called comorbid conditions. So with thousands of patients, we're gonna have lots of different concomitant medicines on board, and we'll also have many comorbid conditions. So we wanna make sure this agent continues to be safe when these patients have all these different other types of characteristics. Once we have collected the data from our phase one, phase two, and phase three studies, we can now submit a new drug application at the FDA. So we take the data from those phase one, phase two, phase three trials and submit all that data for FDA review. Usually takes about one to two years for that FDA review if the data are accurate, collected with high integrity, and have high quality. Then the FDA approves the medicine at that point in time. The FDA approves it and it is allowed to be um, sold on the pharmacy shelves. And thereafter, we continue into phase four where we're still collecting data mostly on safety of, of the prescribing of this new agent out in the community. So many of the doctors or physicians who are prescribing this medication out in the community now can report directly to the FDA about any adverse events they are experiencing with their um, patients. So what's the purpose of those preclinical studies? We wanna make sure that we can warrant the testing of potential therapeutics in humans by proving beneficial effects in the lesser models. And some of those lesser models that we mentioned are animal models, cell culture, or even computer models where we develop algorithms or decision-making tools to see whether or not one particular drug could be more efficacious than another, and then we can use it as an agent in our human trials. So let's talk about the types of clinical research studies that we conduct with regard to new agents. First, we could have treatment studies that are meant to treat the disease of study. And so this would be an intervention with a drug, a device, or some sort of biologic that has an outcome of treating the disease and alleviating symptoms. We can have a study of prevention of disease. If we give a particular drug and we wanna prevent disease, for instance, Alzheimer's disease, we would look at the symptoms uh, of individuals who are cognitively impaired, provide the agent, and see if we can prevent the disease from going to full Alzheimer's disease. We could also do screening studies or early detection studies. Screening for cancer has become widespread, and some, uh, one recent study of CT scans versus x-rays found that CT scans were better uh, interventions for screening for lung disease in patients who had smoked. So this is a screening tool that can be used based upon a clinical research study uh, result. Diagnostic studies are to see if we can diagnose diseases, diagnose diseases early. So we might be using some sort of dye, new dye or new scanning device to be able to diagnose disease before we even see some of the symptoms. Or we could have genetic studies where we are testing people 
who have certain genetic profiles and see if they are at risk for particular diseases. We could do quality of life and supportive care studies. This is very important for those chronic conditions that have a rapid escalation into increased morbidity where patients get very sick over a short period of time. And so we just are interested in improving their quality of life for that little time that they have left. Or we can do observational studies and just follow people as they are treated by their primary care providers and see who develops disease and who doesn't develop disease. Or we can do epidemiological studies, I'm an epidemiologist by training, that looks at the incidence of pre and prevalence of disease in certain populations and seeing whether or not demographic factors such as sex, age, um, race, have an impact on disease incidence and prevalence out in the community and in large populations. So let's talk about components of a clinical trial, a true clinical trial where we are trying to seek out a new treatment for a disease such as DMD. These are the components of the clinical trial and we're going to take each one of them in turn. So we're going to talk about study design, protocol, intervention, risks, benefits, randomization, placebo, blindedness, and informed consent as a component of the clinical trial. With regard to study design, the definition of the study design is the formulation of the experimental approach. And in clinical trials, some of the examples might be safety, where we're testing for whether or not the drug causes adverse effects, especially in humans. We could do a dose escalation study where we're seeing whether or not one dose is better than another dose in terms of uh, causing an effect on the symptoms or the progression of a particular disease. We would look at efficacy to see if the drug works at all, and typically this is usually in increments uh, of efficacy, and sometimes with a higher dose we'll see increased efficacy. We could do an observational study and just observe over time patients who do, are prescribed a particular drug or who are not prescribed a particular drug and see their outcomes long term. Or we can do a medical records review and compile data from large segments of the population. For instance, here at UCLA, we have an electronic medical record that can be mined for its data based upon prescription pri prescribing practices and the outcomes for our patients over the long term in terms of survival, in terms of um, decreased hospitalizations or emergency room visits. So large data sets can be very important and medical reviews can be very important from a study design and can give us ideas about recreating new clinical trials that are important for testing new medicines. Okay, with regard to the protocol, the protocol's definition is a clearly written description of the study. You might want to think of this as a recipe for cookies or a cake or part of a cookbook, but basically it has to have certain components. It has to have the background of the agent being studied, some of the objectives of that particular clinical trial, the target population that we want to look at. Is it people with early disease or later disease? And who should we include and exclude from the trial? the study design and organization, some of the procedures and tests, and what time points we're going to take those tests on our research subjects, and then any contingency plans that we might have a need for in terms of adverse events. And adverse events on clinical trials are really important because we need to make sure that we record those adverse events, we evaluate them in the context of the study, we determine a relationship as to whether or not it's related to the study agent, and we report to the regulatory authorities as needed. Okay, interventions are the type of agent, procedure, or activity being studied. So the type of agent could be a drug, a device, or a biologic, or we could undergo some sort of imaging procedure as part of the clinical trial, or any other activity being studied. So for example, we could have a medication to treat epilepsy, a new device to improve bypass surgery, or a diet or exercise regimen for people who are overweight. So these are all the different types of inter interventions that we might have as part of a clinical study. 
So let's talk about the risks and benefits with regard to clinical research. For risk, the definition of, res uh, of risk is the probability of harm or injury. It could be physical, such as a, a, an adverse event associated with this study agent. It could be psychological, finding out about a cancer diagnosis. It could be social, the stigma of participating in an HIV vaccine trial where the participant will test HIV positive, or economic, such as um, loss of insurance or a job with regard to participation in clinical trials or from a particular diagnosis that's found out during the course of a clinical trial. Some of the benefits um, and the definition of a benefit is a valued or a desired outcome. It's an advantage. And we talked about in our last module about personal benefits from participation in a clinical trial as well as societal benefits. And the IRB will make that determination about the differences between these uh, benefits and how they relate to the risks of a particular trial. Okay, with regard to randomization, the definition of randomization is the assignment of subjects to different treatments interventions or conditions according to chance. So we have a number of potential subjects in a research trial and we are going to randomly assign them to either be in the control group or the investigational group where they are going to receive the medication or treatment under study. Sometimes we have a one-to-one -one randomization where exactly the same number of subjects are in the control group as we have in the investigational group. But other times, especially with significant diseases, we may have a two-to-one randomization where twice as many people receive the investigational drug versus the control group. And oftentimes, we may even see three-to-one randomization where three times the number of individuals receive the investigational drug versus the control group. So this is important in balancing out the differences between our potential research arms of the study. So we wanna make sure that we have just as many females in the control group as we have in the investigational group, just as many um, people of a certain age in each of the groups. So we wanna even out all other characteristics except the drug under study that would be different between these two groups. And typically in a publication of a clinical trial, this can be evaluated in table one of a study where we compare the characteristics of individuals in the control group with the investigational group. So now let's talk about placebos. Placebos are a pill or similar substance with no known effects in the place of the research agent. And in order to show that the research agent works, it must be better than the placebo. So the pharmaceutical manufacturers when they are conducting a placebo-controlled trial, will manufacture a drug that looks exactly similar. The placebo for that particular drug looks exactly similar to the real drug, so that participants on a clinical trial will not be able to determine the differences. Now, for clinical studies, we often find that there is a 30% placebo effect where, in fact, people who receive placebo may actually have an alleviation of symptoms. So we want to make sure that we are doing placebo-controlled trials when appropriate. And in some instances, in chronic conditions, especially with high mortality, placebo-controlled trials from an ethical standpoint may not even be appropriate. Blinded studies are important as part of research. Again, we talked about placebo not being able to make a determination between the drug and the sugar pill or the dummy pill. But blinded studies are a type of study design comparing two or more interventions in which some individuals do not know the group assignment for a participant. So we can have a single blind study where only the research participant doesn't know which arm of the study they are on, or we can have a double-blinded study where both the research participant and the investigator do not know which arm of the study that the participant is on. The pharmacy would know which arm of the study because they're dispensing the medicines, and if need be, we can unblind a study. We call it unblinding of a study when we make the determination to break the code 
that shows which subjects are receiving the drug itself and which uh, subjects may be receiving a placebo pill or a comparator drug. So unblinding can occur when the Data and Safety Monitoring Board decides that there's a safety issue or an efficacy issue with regard to the clinical trial. And they would unblind the study and make sure that everybody found out, especially the investigators and the participants, of any issues that might change their mind about participating or continuing to participate in a clinical study. Informed consent, we mentioned this in module one, it continues to be part of our definition terminology here in module two. It's a person's voluntary agreement based upon adequate knowledge and understanding of relevant information to participate in research or to undergo a procedure. So, as part of this process, there is the discussion between the investigator and the potential research subject, and there's a document that's required to make the subject aware of all the requirements of the clinical study, the purpose of the clinical study, any alternatives that they have to not participate in the clinical study and receive treatment elsewhere. And some of those requirements are listed here. There are ongoing discussions about information found out about the study. Maybe the DSMB has provided more information or maybe another study has been published recently and there's information from that other study that has an impact on our study and the outcomes for our study. There are, the risks are, should be listed, the benefits should be listed, and the alternatives should be listed as part of the informed consent process. We want to make sure that research subjects comprehend the information they're receiving. So they not only need to receive the information, but they need to be able to comprehend it in order to make an autonomous decision about participating in the study. So comprehension of the information is very important. So the informed consent process needs to be in the language of the participant. For instance, if they're a Spanish-speaking participant, they need to be receive an informed consent document in Spanish and have an investigator who speaks Spanish explain all the requirements of the study, the purpose, et cetera, in a language understandable to them. Voluntariness means that that person is able to make a decision on their own. For instance, we talked about children not being able to make their own decisions, but some oftentimes their parents will make the decision, and there are certain consenting processes available for children who are 12 years and older. They may be able to receive the same consent document that their parent receives in order to be able to consent to the research. And usually a person's signature indicating that they understand the requirements of the clinical trial and are willing and able to participate in it is required as part of federal law. So if you want further information about the overview of drug discovery and the development process, here are two websites that you might want to go to. The Pipeline of Hope indicates how drugs help in medical advancements and help in alleviating and treating disease. And the video on clinical trials gives you a synopsis and a uh, overview of the clinical trials process that we've talked about today. So let's do a one minute write. What are some of the problems with informed consent for a potential subject? Given all the information that you've received in both module one and module two. The answer, and you may have other answers as well, but here are some important answers to the question posed. Younger subjects and cognitively decisionally impaired subjects may not be able to evaluate all of the benefits and consequences of participating in a study. So if someone is not able to make a decision, whether they are too young to make a decision or they're cognitively impaired, would not be able to participate in a research study without having a surrogate or a parent available to help in that decision making. 
Those without sufficient income may have no choice but to participate in a research study. And we don't want to coerce individuals into participating in a research study or have any undue influence of this, uh, of research subjects to participate in a research study. So it's important that these factors do not come into play and we make sure that someone is truly volunteering for a clinical research study because they want to advance science or find personal benefits for themselves for treating their disease. Sometimes we find that people lack scientific or health literacy and might not know their rights as a subject in a research study or don't understand the procedures because of their scientific or health uh, lack of knowledge. And so these are important considerations also when conducting an informed consent discussion with potential research subjects. So the purpose of the consent process from the perspective of the potential participant is to understand the research and know that it's not treatment. Primary care providers may also find themselves in the role as investigator, and so they wear two different hats. As the primary care provider, their goal is to find the best treatment for their patient. But as an investigator, they are interested in making sure that subjects enroll in their clinical trial, that they are able to collect the data on those subjects and then publish the data. So it's important that people understand this conundrum of having people serve in two roles and this would be considered a conflict of interest that needs to be disclosed in the consent process. Potential participants need to know what to expect from taking part in a research study, have all their questions answered before they sign the document, and they are free to make a decision on their own about participation. In some communities around the world, People are not as autonomous as we are in the United States, and so maybe tribal leaders make decisions on the part of their community, or government leaders make decisions on the part of different um, entities within their country. So when doing international research, these are important considerations to, to, for the IRB to take under their consideration for the recruitment of subjects. The California Experimental Research Bill of Rights came about because the California legislature thought that it was important that patients and subjects have rights with regard to making their decision about participating in research. And some of those components of the Bill of Rights is that the research subject should be informed about a number of items. And this follows along with the purpose of the informed consent uh, process, that they should know the nature and purpose of the study, that all the risks, side effects, and discomforts and benefits uh, should be disclosed, know about the procedures, any alternatives that they may have, and what to do if complications occur while they are participating in the study. Research subjects will be allowed to ask questions, ample time to decide to participate, to be able to refuse to participate, and to receive a signed and dated copy of the informed consent form. So when a participant is thinking about um, being in a clinical trial, they'll go through the informed consent process, they'll be presented with the research subjects bill of rights, and also will be presented with the HIPAA authorization form for the investigator to be able to extract the research data that's required as part of the study. Let's go back to our case study and revisit it. A new drug compound Bruinite sulfate is identified as a potential therapeutic for DMD. How long would it take before it will reach the shelves at our local pharmacy and who should be included in the target study population? So think about this, think about some of the schematics that we looked at and some of the components of a clinical trial and the selection of research subjects in a clinical trial. So our case study answers. It's highly variable. It sometimes can take up to 15 years. When we were doing HIV research, we shrunk down the timeline for the approval of medicines sometimes down to two years. And that was a really unique time in FDA history and probably will not be repeated. Research and development is very expensive and time consuming. Hopefully we'll see a rapid development 
for DMD because it is considered a rare disease and the FDA chooses rare diseases to escalate and accelerate the research process um, and the drug development process of those types of agents. And there are a number of agents currently in clinical testing. Part of the second part of the answer is with regard to ethical conflicts with target populations. Sometimes potential participants are denied entry into very promising therapeutics due to strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. And this is especially true in DMD research. Sometimes potential subjects have such advanced disease that testing new agents in that population may not be appropriate because there likely is not going to be any efficacy. However, outside of clinical trials, there are expanded access protocols for patients who may want to receive the agents outside of clinical trials. So we call these compassionate use protocols, parallel track protocols, because people are not in the clinical trials where the true testing is being conducted, but some data is being collected on them through these parallel track arrangements. Here's a one minute write for you. Elaborate on the conflicts of interest between the primary care physician and the researcher when the same person is wearing both hats for both roles in a clinical study. And the answer, we have to look at the competing interests of those individuals wearing those two hats. The researcher wants to maximize enrollment and the doctor wants to focus on the subject's well-being and treatment. And the conflict is that researchers might feel tempted to retain and recruit ineligible subjects that a doctor might not approve of as being the best treatment for their patient. So these are ethical pulls and tugs that occur in clinical research often, both from the financial standpoint of receiving compensation from pharmaceutical companies, as well as these non-financial conflicts of interest elucidated in the answer to this, research, uh, this question. In a public survey of research participation, 87% of individuals are very or somewhat willing to participate in research. And this number was more close to, closer to 60% about five years ago and has increased significantly uh, over the last five years. But only 20% have mentioned that their doctors have told them about participating in a research study. So there are research studies for healthy volunteers, there are research studies for people with particular conditions, and this is kind of um, a, a taking a pulse of the public perceptions of clinical research. And this shows that there is a high public and a positive public per perception of research in that 80%, 87% of people would be willing to participate in research. So here's a one minute write. Have you ever participated or been asked to participate in a clinical trial? If yes, how was your experience as a participant? And if not, why did you choose not to participate? So here's another one minute write. Why would volunteers participate in clinical trials? Why? Because they might want to find a relief or a cure for their own condition. They might want to help advance science, and this is especially true of healthy volunteers who participate in clinical trials. They might be interested in receiving free study medicine because there's usually no charges to the subject for participating in a clinical study since all charges are charged to the sponsor of this particular study. They might be referred by their physician to the study. They want to earn some extra money because oftentimes there are stipends for time and effort for participating, or they might want to receive better medical care because there are often more visits to the medical center or to the clinic as part of a clinical trial. Why wouldn't volunteers participate in clinical trials? There are also a number of reasons. 
because they have a lack of knowledge, and that might stem from that scientific or health lack of literacy. Financial constraints, not able to get to the site for the clinical research or childcare issues. Insurance issues, they don't want the insurance company to know about their participation or they have a disease that their insurance company does not know about. Fear of the risks of research or unsure of the personal benefits to them. It might require more visits to the research sites or lingering questions or doubts that they just don't have answered by the time they complete their informed consent discussion and questions about lack of confidentiality. With regard to the current state of clinical trials in DMD research, there's some new FDA guidelines for DMD drug development for DMD and its associated conditions. So these guidelines are typically not promulgated for certain disease entities, but it's so important from the DMD perspective that the FDA felt compelled to encourage research in this area. So I highly recommend that you look at these FDA guidelines and see how the FDA wants to target drug development in this particular area. There's also a February 2015 update from the Muscular Dystrophy Association about the progress of several DMD therapeutic agents currently in clinical trials. And the MDA advocacy and news website is also available to you for uh, reviewing on your own time. This is a book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot, who published it in 2010. And it's a compendium of clinical research issues as it relates to the HeLa cells. And the HeLa cells are cells that were first taken, cancer cells that were first taken from Henrietta Lacks. So you can see the name of the HeLa cells comes from H-E-L-A. And her cancer cells divided an astronomical rate and were used by researchers all around the world to develop new vaccines and treatments. But unfortunately, when she was uh, being treated at Johns Hopkins University, she wasn't asked about uh, the researchers taking cells from her and developing them in the lab. So her informed consent process was basically um, uninformed and unfortunately she didn't have a lot much health or scientific literacy and so and also during this time during the 1950s there were not many regulations with regard to the informed consent and research process so this book was developed um, over a long period of time it's called um, historical nonfiction and Rebecca Skloot follows the lives of Henrietta Lack's ancestors as they find out about the use of their mother's or grandmother's cells over the past half century. And it touches on a number of clinical research topics that we've gone over here. The confidentiality of participants, the sharing of data and specimens. Then in the 1950s and 60s, investigators would ask another investigator to share some cells and they'd say, sure, here, take some. But that wouldn't be allowed today without proper authorization and um, following the regulatory requirements. The socioeconomic status of uh, Henrietta at the time she was seeking her treatment. Religion plays into this historical uh, perspective of clinical trials, as well as the scientific and health literacy issues and the media coverage of scientific advancements in clinical research. I highly encourage you to read the book and uh, understand the clinical research process and the drug development process and part of all the medical advancements that have occurred because of HeLa cells and the whole clinical research enterprise. I hope in my modules one and two that you have had an appreciation of clinical research in general, the regulations that are associated with it, the drug development process, and the conflicts of interest that arise as we consider new medicines that can help to treat disease and alleviate suffering for those who have chronic disease. Thank you. Thank you.